This presentation aims to introduce you to the Old Bids World, an open-air museum project in North East England that is now in the process of redeveloping and therefore being reassessed after its closure and sudden reopening with the name of Jarrow Anglo-Saxon Farm, Village and Bead Museum. Its new administrator, Groundwork South and North Tyneside, part of the National Groundwork Federation, was left with very poor documentation about the museum and the related open-air project. For this reason, this presentation is itself part of documenting the site, collecting for the first time an updated history of the museum as an essential background to the redevelopment of the site carried out by Groundwork. The work currently undertaken by John Rahul's team aims to carefully document the state of the buildings which are part of the collection of replicas composing the openness section of the museum. The entire project was ignited by the excavation from 1963 to 1978 of the 7th 8th century site of St Paul's Monastery in the modern town of Jarrow in Tyne and Ware, UK. The mission was led by Dame Professor Rosemary Cramp, renowned early medievalist from Durham University, who investigated also Mongwe Mouth, St Paul's Twin Monastery in Sunderland. Professor Cramp was also one of the main promoters of the opening in 1974 of a first display of the artefacts from her excavations, hosted in the nearby late Georgian family house known as Jarrow Hall. The display aimed to tell the story of the Venerable Bede who spent his life at Jarrow Monkwear Mouth Monastery and the lifestyle of the people living at his times in 7th and 8th century Britain. This was updated in 1979 with the efforts of the St Paul's Jarrow Development Trust and from then known as Bead Monastery Museum. This building held the museum until 1998. In 1985, 20 oil tanks were demolished in the ex-industrial lot just on the right side of Jarrow Hall, towards the River Tyne. In 1988, the advent of Tyne and Ware Development Corporation as part of its main aim to regenerate the Tyne River frontages from Newcastle to the River Mouth promoted the plan of a capital programme for the construction of a new multi-million pound museum building. Contemporarily, it was decided that the ex-industrial lot north of Jarrow Hall, left derelict since the demolition of the oil tanks, should have now been reclaimed, reshaping the 15 acres of polluted land in a 700 AD agricultural landscape to showcase elements of farming and secular life in Bede's time. The Arrarian landscape, named Jiri after the Old English name of Jarrow, was conceived in 1991, mechanically shaped between 1992 and 1993, and planted up in 1993, following a rigid set of schemes which ensured to include in the project all the essences attested in the region before 700 AD. In the meanwhile, in May 1993, a workshop was held to discuss the entire GRE project, inviting academics and experts in timber buildings. This would have informed the project with solid scientific principles and building expertise since its very beginning. Initially, three different sites were selected for the reproduction of Anglo-Saxon buildings, the Royal Residence of Yevering, northwest of Wooler, in North Northumberland, the settlement of Thurlings, a few kilometres to the northeast of Yevering, and a Gruben House from the site of New Bewick in the same area. The Royal Palace of Yevering, the most ambitious reconstruction, was initially put aside to, instead, gain experience with a smaller and more feasible project. Therefore, the construction of Building A from the Thurling site began in April 1994, and the dobing was then completed in 1997. Although, in one of our archival searches, we could find the initial GW activity and land use policy, where it was specified that records should have been kept of all the experimental activities, we were not able to recover this documentation, surmising that it was ever completed. However, a clear description of the construction process, the timing and the essences used in the construction of Building A was reported by Susan Mills in her Reconstructing Northumbrian Timber Buildings, The Beatworld Experience. 
It is interesting to know that the construction of this building was carried out by a constructor, an expert in traditional boat building who trained a joiner for this specific goal, assisted by two volunteers. The lack of any mention in meals of experimental archaeologists on site at the time of the construction led us to believe that, while the initial project was conceived with the support of scholars, an appropriate experimental logbook with systematic notes according to a documentation protocol was unlikely to have been in place. The new museum building opened in May 2000, five years after the opening in May 1995 of its first portion, titled Phase 1, currently occupied by the main impluvium at the entrance. The architectural choice to recreate portions of Mediterranean late classical antiquity, such as the entrance which resembles a Roman villa or the main display hall shaped as a Roman basilica, represents the cultural prelude to the foundation of Jaro Monkwemouth Monastery and the frequent travels to Rome that influenced the monastery founder Benedict Biscop to conceive his monastery as a modern continental establishment up to date in its architecture, facilities and liturgy. In this map, Included in the last guidebook produced by Beats World in 2004, it is evident that the Royal Palace of Yvering was then still a project that the management was aiming for. The original plan to build the Royal Palace of Yvering was definitely abandoned in 2013, when the award of a heritage lottery fund of £311,700 allowed the construction of another majestic structure from the same archaeological site, the so-called Grand Stand. This is a large Odeon-like structure, of which we can see in this slide the graphic reconstruction suggested by the excavator in his 1977 publication of the site, and the actual reinterpretation realised at Beats World by Ancient Arts Ltd and Brand Tomes Ltd. This was not intended as an experimental project, mainly due to financial limitations, and it was built with modern materials and techniques, with the main aim to demonstrate how the structure would have appeared. For the same reason, three accessory structures, a stage for the grandstand and two workshop buildings, were also built in Anglo-Saxon style and not as experimental reconstruction. Beats World officially closed in February 2016 after a series of frequent changes in administration, but was promptly reopened the following October thanks to the National Environmental Charity Groundwork, with the name of Jarrow Hall Anglo-Saxon Farm, Village and Beat Museum. The charity saw in the Open Air Museum its highly valuable potential and a fruitful opportunity to deliver its own vision, building skills and improving job prospects, redesigning our neglected open spaces for 21st century use, helping people make their own decisions about their area, motivating and developing young people, promoting greener ways of living and working. This passage of ownership did not happen without difficulties. This represented for groundwork its first involvement with the culture and heritage side, a challenge made even more difficult by its particular nature as an archaeological open air museum. The first few years were spent by Groundwork to solve the most pressing necessities of the museum, such as the well-being of the Jiri resident animals, all belonging to rare ancient indigenous breeds, and a series of essential maintenance works to the main museum building and the grounds, investing more than £100,000. In 2019, after a new National Lottery Heritage Fund was awarded, it was possible to complete the design of an accurate 15-year resilient heritage master plan, which is now in the process of its early delivery stages. The first essential phase of the master plan regards the open-air area, specifically the Anglo-Saxon Buildings Collection. Major maintenance works on the replicas, bear in mind the Thurlings is almost 30 years old, are now in the process of being planned and priced. However, Keeping in mind that these buildings and the entire farm of Jiwi were intended as an ongoing experiment, a series of necessary precautions had to be taken. Through the collaboration with Exxon, Experimental Archaeology Newcastle, a newly established research group founded by PhD students at Newcastle University, entirely dedicated to experimental archaeology, 
groundwork promoted the reestablishment of experimental archaeology as a major part of the activities on site. Being aware of the importance of experimental protocols, in the plannings of GEO's redevelopment, the museum staff led a preliminary building assessment involving the volunteers' team. Initially, in absence of an experimental archive from Bitworld, a comprehensive literature review regarding the museum and the experiments was carried out. Seven entries were found and the main general info on the experimental projects was so collected. A dedicated team of volunteers named Jaro 780 was then set up to allow those of our volunteers interested in experimental archaeology and living history to meet regularly and contribute with their work and ideas to the redevelopment of GEV. It was then possible to design an action plan to carry out a preliminary assessment of the experimental buildings. The members of Jaro 780 were asked to survey Jirwi and different groups were assigned to different buildings for a preliminary assessment. An online shared folder has been created where both assessment pictures and reports filled in by staff and volunteers could be uploaded. In this way, the museum staff could systematically collect this updated information and create an appropriate archive. During the assessment, major conservative issues, which will need a professional intervention, were identified. However, minor conservation jobs were also identified and it was decided that this could have been carried out directly by Jaro 700 AD. This included, for example, the redobbing of small portions of the walls and a general lime wash. All the people involved in minor and conservative interventions were asked to take plenty of pictures before, during and after their work, as well as to complete a logbook with the description and details of their interventions. This allowed a non-invasive intervention on the structures and minimised the effects of age on the building's appearance to the public eye. The recipes and ratios of both daub and lime wash were collected in the experimental logbook. The general assessment, however, confirmed overall that the buildings are now in need of major conservative interventions. Initially, the report, assessment, repair forms were handwritten and quite basic. To improve this, in absence of any drawing of the reconstructions, we readapted the plans and axonometric projections suggested by O'Brien and Mikett in their publication of the site. Each post and wall were appropriately numbered and named to facilitate the correct referencing. We appreciate that we are just at the beginning of the process, and these basic documentation strategies will have to be implemented with the progression of the project. The future major conservative interventions will be the perfect opportunity to develop and apply more sophisticated documentation strategies on which we are still working. One of these is the use of laser scan technology to document and monitor the experimental buildings and produce digital maps useful in the repairs assessment process. We're currently looking at this possibility with the McCourt Centre for Landscape at Newcastle University. As part of the major interventions identified by the general assessment, the Gruben House needs urgently retouching. The walls of its internal pit, contained by a wattle fence, are now collapsing due to the nature of the reclaimed soil the structure was dug in. A rare archival picture of the Gruben House, taken just after its construction, compared to recent pictures, gives an idea of the gravity of the roof's current condition. The Thurling's roof also needs some touching repairs and the main structural poles show evidence of deterioration in the founding portion. The beginning of the poster composition was noticed just three and a half years after construction, when the foundation trenches were excavated at the doorways to insert the door seals, as mentioned by Niels. This is probably due to the kind of reclaimed soil used which is certainly not a well-drained, solid, anaerobic clay and probably would not have been the first choice of Anglo-Saxon builders. What next? The archival research for the recorded documentation of our reconstructed buildings proceeds. The assessment on the health status of the reconstructions confirmed that touching repairs are needed as well as a structural survey by professionals.
Our volunteers team has been part of this research documentation process since the beginning, actively supporting the project with their own personal input. Appropriate report forms have been created to allow the volunteers to document their observations and their minor interventions, always approved and supervised by a member of staff with experience in experimental archaeology. All the data collected in our virtual archive by the volunteers has been processed and organized in a preliminary archive. The archive has been essential to inform the application of a new National Lottery Heritage Fund grant, which will be submitted shortly. If successful, we will be able to begin the delivery of the first phase of our 15-year master plan, entirely focused on the redevelopment of GWI and the open air area of the museum. Within this redevelopment project, from an experimental point of view, Groundwork committed to pay great attention to the value of this building's history, documented and creating track of every possible intervention. The Thatcher who will look after the repairs needed in this phase of the project will contemporarily deliver a training aimed to the museum staff and the volunteers team. Considering that thatching is a highly skilled craft, it is obvious that it will be impossible for our staff and volunteers to become professionals in this field after a basic training. However, this is an attempt to make the entire operation as resilient as possible, facilitating the delivery of future in-house minor repairs. This is still a work in progress. Feedback and suggestions are very much appreciated and welcomed. Thank you.